Jack, and preparing a talk for us. And um, over to you. Great. Right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, it's great to have so many people here today uh, to learn about the amazing world of fungi. Um, as Helen said, I'm Jack and I work for the Devon Biodiversity Records Centre. So I tend to get involved in all sorts of community work and species recording. But I'm also lucky enough to get to work with Green Minds Project and conduct these talks. Um, now, I must say, I'm by no means an expert in fungi. And up until a few years ago, I knew very little about them. Uh, however, it's been a growing interest of mine. And hopefully today I can get a few more people hooked and introduce you to their ecology and a few common and interesting fungi for you to spot whilst out and about. Um, also, just to let you know, we will have time for questions at the end, as Alan said, um, and I'll do my best to answer them. And if not, I can hopefully point you in the right direction. So what are fungi? Um, well, in ecology, we like to group things and a kingdom is a large overarching group, which includes a variety of similar organisms. Now, we fall into the animal kingdom, which includes all living animals. So you also have the plant kingdom, which includes all of your trees and flowers. And then you have the fungi kingdom, which is what we'll focus on today. Now, interestingly, we do share some similar genetics to fungi, and we are actually more closely related to fungi than we are plants and shared a common ancestor even after plants became distinct in themselves. Um, and fungi first emerged as a separate organism around seven, 715 and 810 million years ago. Um, so fungi are spore producing organisms. Now, spores are single cells which act like a tiny seed, which can then be spread by the wind or by other means. Um, and then they can then form fungi independently. Um, now, they also feed off of organic matter, which is really important. Um, and that includes things such as rotting wood, which is typically quite difficult for um, other organisms to break down. Um, so fungi can vary greatly in size um, from microscopic single cell organisms uh, to making up one of the biggest organisms in the world, uh, which is a type of honey fungus, um, which we have in the UK, but this one in particular covers around nine kilometers squared of a forest in Oregon. And it weighs up to 605 tons. Um, and it's also thought to be around 2,400 years old, um, which is really, really amazing. Um, now, often fungi, particularly mushrooms, produce vast roots, uh, root like structures. Um, and these are called mycelium. And these often aren't visible because they're typically below the surface. Um, but occasionally you can see them, like in this photo. Um, so if you look here on the photo, you can see this kind of white cloud like thing, I guess. Um, and these are those mycelium networks. And it's these mycelium that transport nutrients and send signals um, between fungi. Um, and they're kind of, they are essential for fungi to survive. Um, and you can kind of think of it a little bit like our own nervous system, um, as we have nerves to send signals and our blood vessels will transport nutrients around. Um, so yeah, the uh, mycelium are really essential for fungi. So there are three main types of fungi, which we can further sort of subgroup them into. The first of which being molds, um, and you commonly find these on things like rotting food. Um, so if you wanna find these, if, and you've got a food waste bin, the best thing to do is leave some food in there and take a look and you'll most likely find some mold. Um, we also have yeasts, which are those single cell organisms. Um, and we most commonly associate these with bread, beer, and the ever divisive marmite. Um, now all these would have originally come from uh, wild strains, which you might find on things like wheat or apple. Um, and we still harness these today in sort of natural brewing processes, um, such as making cider. Uh, and finally, we have mushrooms, which are typically what people think of when we hear the word fungi. Um, these can most easily by, be identified by the large fruiting bodies, uh, but they also include those mycelium networks, uh, which are below the surface. Uh, and it's mushrooms, which we'll be focusing on in particular today. So 
what's the life cycle of a mushroom? Um, I've made this very crude drawing um, and tried to break, break it down into some sort of key stages. Um, and we'll start from the fruiting body, as that's probably the easiest way, but you could start from anywhere in this cycle. So you have the fruiting body, which is what you would think of as the mushroom. And uh, on the underside of the cap, which is the top bit, you have gills. Uh, and it's in these gills where spores are produced. Um, these spores are then carried by the wind um, or through disturbance. So it might be that you brush up against it uh, and spores get um, attached to your clothes that work with fur with animals. Um, or in some cases, there are some fungi which will project these spores out. Um, and if they land in a suitable place, they will germinate uh, and begin to form that mycelium network. Then once it comes time uh, for the fungi to want to start reproducing, uh, it will start to develop a fruiting body. Um, and that might be in a sort of egg-like case in some cases, um, or just a really tiny version of um, the actual fruiting body. And then once again, that will grow up, develop spores, and the cycle starts all over again. Um, now, there are a few more complex elements, but that's the real basics. So where can you find fungi? Well, fungi can be found all over the world um, with mushrooms typically being found in woodlands as woodlands host a wide variety of organic matter for them to break down. So lots of dead wood, leaf litter, um, even things like um, kind of decaying bodies, which isn't very nice, but if you've got sort of dead deer, mushrooms do help break that down. Um, however, fungi can also be found growing in aquatic habitats, urban environments, and other terrestrial habitats like sand dunes. And um, I was watching a presentation the other day, and I think in that they said that fungi are actually one of the first organisms to actually emerge out of the oceans millions of years ago. Um, and interestingly, there is also evidence of um, fungi surviving in space on the outsides of spaceships and satellites. Um, so they really are pretty hardy organisms. So why are fungi important? Well, fungi play a vital role in breaking down organic matter, which in turn releases nutrients back into the environment to be used by other organisms, which allows them to thrive. They can break down some of the toughest natural substances, such as lignin, uh, which is typically found in wood, uh, and they effectively act as part of nature's recycling network. The fungi in themselves also provide a really valuable food source for both animals and humans. I know humans typically eat a really large variety of mushrooms, so you might find small field mushrooms in your supermarkets, um, but then we also prize things like truffles, which are really expensive um, and they're eaten all throughout the world. Um, but then going back to yeasts, we also utilize those in things like baking and brewing. Um, and so, yeah, they're a massive part of our um, diet. So fungi also form something called a mutualistic relationship, uh, which is where they trade nutrients with other organisms that they each respectively would be unable to produce or gather themselves. So a common example of this is the fly agaric mushroom, which is your, uh, we'll talk about it later, but it's the sort of famous red cap with white spots when you typically think of as a toadstool. Um, so the fly agaric mushroom exchanges nutrients with birch trees, uh, and these birch trees photosynthesize and produce nutrients from light, uh, which the mushrooms themselves are unable to do. They'll then trade these compounds um, for other compounds that are broken down by the fungi, um, allowing them both to thrive really um, and gain nutrients that they wouldn't be able to do without that mutualistic relationship. Uh, and that is really essential um, throughout lots of ecosystems. Now, finally, fungi within the kind of human world are used in medicines uh, pretty much worldwide, uh, with one of the most notable ones being penicillin. Um, now, penicillin was first discovered by Alexander Fleming, which is um, this gentleman on the slide. Um, and he accidentally allowed mold to grow on some of his bacteria covered slides. And what happened was um, this mold ended up killing off 
some of the bacteria and that led to the birth of antibiotics and we still use penicillin to this day uh, and other strains. But within the medical world more recently, fungi are being tested and used in treating things such as PTSD and depression uh, with chemicals produced by mushrooms, uh, particularly a chemical called psilocybin, um, which contributes to changes in our own neurochemistry, um, which can have a really positive reaction in reducing the symptoms of these issues. Um, so yeah, that's becoming more frequently used, um, which is a good thing. So fungi can also cause a variety of issues. Um, and this is from a human perspective, um, as ultimately fungi aren't deliberately trying to be bad, they're just trying to survive. Um, but one of the main issues is fungal infections. So this affects plants, animals and humans, um, and this can subsequently have a knock-on effect on one another. So a really good example of this um, is the Great Famine in Ireland in the 1840s, which led to the death of approximately one million people. And it also led to the emigration of a million more, which led to a massive decrease in the population. And although the famine was a really complex issue, one of the main contributing factors was the prevalence of potato blight, um, which you can see in this photo uh, on, I believe, the left-hand side, um, which is of potato blight. And this is a fungal disease which destroys potato crops um, and slowly kills the plant and renders potatoes inedible. Um, and as the potato was a staple of many people's diets, the loss of this crop contributed to mass starvation. And fungal infections still today contribute to large scale crop failures throughout the world. Um, and therefore it's still an issue humans consistently face. Um, from a more ecological perspective, uh, recent fungal diseases include ash dieback, uh, which originally was brought to the UK on some infected timber. Um, and this has led to large scale declines of ash trees within um, our country and habitats. Um, and ash trees play a really vital role in our ecosystems. And as such, we're now having to consider the sort of wide ranging implications of them disappearing and how to replace them. So we're having to think about planting different species, but then you have the issue that if you're only planting a single species, then that may also become susceptible to disease in the future. So it is quite a complex issue. Um, so animals such as amphibians are being lost worldwide, uh, worldwide as a result of something called a chytrid fungus. Um, and that has really decimated populations. Um, but we as humans still encounter common issues such as fungal infections in our own day-to-day -day lives. So that could be something not too severe, such as a fungal nail infection, but then you can have quite nasty internal fungal infections, um, which can be quite difficult to treat. Um, however, these infections can also lead to some quite interesting uh, occurrences. So this picture, which I took out on a survey, is uh, something called a zombie fly. Um, and essentially what happens is a fungi will infect a fly and then it hijacks the body and essentially takes control of its mind. Uh, and in this case, the fly will climb to the top of some vegetation where the fungi will slowly kill the fly and produce spores. Now these spores are then in a prime position to be spread by the wind as um, the top of the flower catches a breeze but also if there's other bugs visiting uh, the flower then the spores can also be passed on and carries on and so yep not good for the fly but nonetheless very interesting okay so how do we identify mushrooms so we'll move on from the ecology now so First of all, there's the fruiting body, which is what we think of as the mushroom. And these come in all different shapes, colors, and sizes. Uh, and we can observe these things to help us identify mushrooms. So when I talk about the cap, uh, the cap is the top of the mushroom. And these vary greatly, uh, but often closely related mushrooms will have similar shaped caps. Now these can be flat, they can be bulbous, they can be wavy, they can be all manner of shapes. Um, but the color and size can help us narrow, narrow down the species. 
Now, under the cap, you have the gills, which are filament-like structures, and they're uh, located beneath the cap, but they're sometimes uh, located along the stem as well. Um, and these are where the spores are produced. And what's quite interesting is if you take the cap of a mushroom and place it down onto a bit of paper, if it's um, full of spores, you'll get something called a spore print. And we can use these similar to a human fingerprint um, to identify mushrooms as they different species will have unique spore prints. Uh, they can also make quite nice artwork. Um, so additionally, the shape and the way in which the gills are attached can help us identify mushrooms. Um, and it's kind of a bit small, but you can see on that photo, it highlights a few different um, ways in which the gills are attached uh, to the mushroom. Um, so like the cat, we can also look at the size, shape and colour of the stem. And it can also be quite useful um, if you're trying to identify mushrooms to have a pocket knife and cut into the stems uh, and also the cap to a certain extent, as some species will change colour uh, and others may be hollow or not hollow. Um, I know we have, I think it's a bolly, which is a type of mushroom, and certain varieties of them will turn blue when bruised or cut into. Um, so I have actually played a game of noughts and crosses on one of them before. So smell and texture, and in some cases, taste are also valuable tools. However, tasting is not always recommended as many fungi can be really deadly. So definitely don't do that. Um, but on a side note, I used to have a colleague um, who was an avid fungi enthusiast, and he claimed to have found an old Victorian collector's journal who was another mushroom enthusiast. And supposedly on the last page of this journal was an incredibly poisonous mushroom with a single tasting note that said it tasted like cucumber. And then for the rest of the book, it was blank pages. So who knows what happened there? Um, and then finally, the other things we can observe are the location, um, such as woodland habitat um, or wood in itself. Um, so specific fungi will grow on specific types of wood. Um, the season is also important, as you'll only see the fruiting bodies at certain time of the year. Uh, the growth patterns, so they might grow in clumps, they might grow individually, or they might grow in lines. Um, and in some cases, you do find them growing in circles, and these are called fairy circles. Um, and in really difficult to identify mushrooms, you can also conduct chemical tests. Um, and you do get some field kits, so you can do that whilst out and about. Um, or you can do genetic testing. And I know this is kind of a developing area, and I believe there were some uh, sites in Wales which were kind of designated based off this genetic testing uh, for rare wax cap fungi. Um, so it's a really interesting but growing field. Okay, so Carrying on with this theme of identifying mushrooms, um, what are some resources you can use? Um, so one of the best things to do is to pick up a field guide. So I have a picture here of a Collins, which is my own personal guide, um, but there are lots of different guides available and you can find these quite commonly in charity bookshops um, or just any other bookshop and online you can usually find them. Um, also, now there are lots of really fantastic apps. So this is a screenshot of an app called iNaturalist, which is what I tend to use. And this also includes uh, or will aid you in identifying things such as plants and animals. So with this app, you can take a picture of a mushroom and it will use an algorithm to suggest the most likely species. Um, and then from there, you can post that picture and other experts around the world and enthusiasts can help you verify your find. Um, and this is also really handy for trying to locate interesting locations to find fungi, as it will um, place pins on a map as to where other fungi were found. Um, so really recommend that app. But there are also other apps which will lead you through a simple key and ask you a series of questions to answer, and that will help you identify fungi. Um, now, there are also other social media groups. So on Facebook, there is a Devon Mushroom and Foraging group, um, and people will post their finds and help you verify your own. But it's also really good for putting you in contact with other people interested in fungi. 
And finally, uh, there are local groups such as the Devon Fungus Group, um, which is run by a group of experts. And they also run, I think, monthly, it might be more often fungal forays where you can meet up with them and go for a walk um, and try and identify fungi. But they're also a really good resource to help put you in con contact with experts if you want to do so. So we'll move on to looking at some common species within the UK in a moment. Um, but just as a general overview, uh, there are over 15,000 species of fungi within the UK. Um, now to put that in context, there are around 1,600 native plant species. There's 574 bird species and around 107 mammals. Um, so the diversity and sheer amount of fungi in the UK is really astounding. Uh, and often it makes it seem like you're only ever scratching the surface when you begin to start identifying them. I know myself, I can only identify a handful and just thinking about the sheer number of them is quite daunting, but it's quite nice because you're always learning something. Um, so yeah, for the rest of the session, I'll focus on highlighting a few common and interesting species which you might come across in day-to-day -day life and walks. Um, and some of them really just are fascinating. Um, and hopefully you might be able to remember what they are, um, or even if you don't remember the name, you might recognize them. But I do really need to emphasize that fungi can be extremely poisonous and lead to death uh, if ingested. So please, please, please don't use this presentation as a foraging guide. Um, if you are interested in foraging, I'm sure there's local experts and groups that can offer courses. But yeah, don't use this as a guide. So first up are puffballs. Now there are various different puffball species, uh, but the majority of them have very similar characteristics. They'll usually vary slightly in color and size uh, and giant puffballs, for example, can grow up to seven centimeters in width and height, which is way bigger than any of the other species. Um, and additionally with puffballs, habitat is a really good indicator for these species as specific puffballs balls are found in specific habitats such as heathland or woodland. So with the common puff ball, it's typically found between July and November. Uh, so they're getting towards the end of the season now, but you can definitely still see them about. And you're most likely to find those in woodlands, uh, but they can also be found in gardens, heaths and pastures. Now, puff balls, when they're young, solid white, and if you cut into them whilst they're young, they'll have quite a spongy internal texture. but as they get older and the spores begin to develop, uh, the puffball will darken in color and begin to collapse. Um, now, when they're at this stage, uh, they will puff out spores when disturbed, uh, and that is how they get their name. And I'm sure if you come across them before, it's quite common to tread on them and send the spores all out. Um, now, these spores will then disperse within the local area, but they can also travel further if they're caught by the wind and just Supposedly, uh, these spores were used historically to staunch the blood flow of wounds on battlefields if they were available. Um, and they also can be eaten when they're young, although I've never tried it myself. Um, but there are a few um, poisonous species which aren't puffballs, but can look quite similar. Um, and also it's worth just being quite careful if you are coming across these and puffing out the spores as inhalation of large amounts of the spores can lead to quite a nasty respiratory disease. So next is the shaggy ink cap. Um, this mushroom is found between April and November uh, and it's an incredibly short lived mushroom, but also very common. Um, so due to the sheer volume of them, you are quite likely to see them when out and about. Uh, it's most commonly found amongst grasslands, gardens and roadside verges. Uh, and the mushroom itself, when young, will have a creamy white colour and the gills will tend to be pink uh, or whitish. Um, however, as they get older or bruised, they will begin to darken and turn black with age. Um, now, the stem of this fungi is quite long and hollow and it's typically slightly swollen at the base. And that's another good way to sort of help identify it. Um, and you're also most likely to see this mushroom when it's spread out like a parasol, but it can look somewhat like a finger, which is um, the other photo on the right hand side um, when it's first emerging. So 
yeah, they can look quite different, but they are the, the same mushroom. So the blackening of the mushroom is where it derives its name. And supposedly it can also be used to create ink when it's heated with water and cloves. Uh, but I've also never done this, but it'd be quite interesting to see. Um, and I just found this online and despite it looking quite flimsy, supposedly um, it has been recorded as being able to lift large concrete slabs up to four centimetres in 48 hours. So though it's flimsy, it is quite, quite powerful. So now we've got the turkey tail, which is a really common bracket fungus, um, and it can be seen all year round. So you're most likely to find it in broadleaf woodland. And that's uh, usually on dead or dying wood, uh, but it can occasionally be found amongst conifers. So it has this really distinctive fan shape, uh, which is likened to a turkey tail, and is how it gets its name. Um, and it will often have differing coloured bands uh, along fungi, which are usually white, yellow, and brown. Um, and these will change over time with age. And this mushroom is, or the fruiting body itself, is in incredibly uh, long living. So um, it's present for quite a while and it hardens over time. And because it's quite a permanent platform, it can also develop uh, algal growth on it, which can make it look greenish in color, but that's not the fungi that is the growth of uh, algae. Now the pores on the underside of this are um, faintly hairy and cream colored, um, which is really distinctive of this fungi. And studies are currently being conducted into this fungi's ability to support immune systems um, and the kind of possible effects it can have at reducing cancer symptoms when incorporated with other uh, anti-cancer drugs. Uh, and I think the sort of current um, results are looking quite promising with it. So now we have the beefsteak fungus, and this is a particularly peculiar looking fungi, which definitely weirded me out the first time I saw it. Uh, but the beefsteak fungus can be found from July to November. And it grows almost exclusively on dead oak, um, although it can be found growing on other freshly cut stumps. Um, it's also typically found at the base. So if you are looking for this mushroom, be sure to keep an eye close to the ground. When it's young, it has quite a gelatinous texture, uh, which feels very odd to the touch. It also has a slightly leathery surface. Um, it's typically deep red to pink on top, um, and it has this cream underside, which will also um, bruise uh, when disturbed, uh, and that will also turn a kind of reddish brown colour. Uh, and also what's quite interesting with this is if you cut through it, uh, it will begin to ooze a red juice, um, and yeah, which is a bit gross, but it is supposedly edible. Uh, but from what I've heard, it's very acidic and definitely not worth it. So here we go, the fly garrick, possibly one of the most distinctive and recognisable mushrooms worldwide. Uh, and it's typically associated with fairies and myth all throughout Europe. It can be found between August and December and is found predominantly in broadleaf woodland where birch is present. Um, it's incredibly distinctive with its red and off-white spots. Uh, and it grows both in groups and individually. Um, and if you live in Plymouth, I've recently seen quite a lot of it off the beaten path in Cam Woods. And it's really impressive. There's been some really large groups of them. Um, so really good to get your camera out and take some photos. Now, the name itself is supposedly derived from its historic use of trapping flies, whereby the mushroom would be broken up and left in milk to attract and stun flies where you could then get rid of them. Um, and additionally, it's still used to this day as Christmas decorations uh, throughout Europe as it can be quite easily dried in the oven. Now, it's an incredibly toxic mushroom uh, and it can have some really strong psychoactive effects. Um, interestingly, though, uh, a substance which contributes to this is called hypotenic acid. Um, and this is thought to be incredibly attractive to reindeer and they really like these fungi. And this has been used. Uh, in Scandinavia for centuries to help herd reindeer. Um, so yeah. Right, next up we have the jelly ear, which is another bracket fungus. And this is present all year round, uh, but I've only ever really found it between January and February. 
Now it grows almost exclusively on elder, which makes identification nice and easy. And it's also really distinctive. So it has an incredibly leathery feel and is dark brown to red in color. And it can survive really harsh winter frosts, um, which is why it persists for so long. Uh, now, in mythology, the fungi is strongly associated with Judas Iscariot, um, who famously betrayed Jesus um, and then ended up hanging himself from an elder tree. And supposedly this fungi represents his soul trying to emerge from the elder. Um, and it's where its scientific name is derived. Uh, it's also meant to be quite good in cooking, but I've also not tried that. Next, we have the Scarlet Elf Cup, which is another winter fungi. Uh, and this tends to be found between December and March, and mainly in broadleaf woodland. Um, it's most commonly found in groups on dead wood uh, and is usually hidden in amongst leaf litter. Uh, it's also strongly associated with hazel. Um, so keep an eye out for it if you're in any woodland where hazel's really dominant. Um, it is incredibly distinctive. There's this really beautiful bright red um, cup shape. Um, and you do also get something called green elf cup. However, you're far less likely to see this. Um, and that also is more of a greenish blue in color. And there's a cool trick with these fungi um, where if you pick up one of the fungi, blow on it and hold it to your ear, you can hear the spores being ejected from the pores. Um, and so, yeah. Um, possibly one of my favorite fungi is the amethyst deceiver. Now I just really like this because it's one of the first ones I learned to ID and it's also just got an amazing color. Um, you can find this between June and November, so you might still find some. It's sort of at the tail end now. Um, and it's primarily found in woodlands where oak and beech are quite dominant. Um, however, I have found it in and amongst conifers, um, so pretty much any woodland, keep an eye out for it. So it has this really beautiful deep purple color when young. Um, this does begin to fade to a more tan brown as it ages. Um, now the stem is usually twisted and hollow on the inside and it has this really wrinkly exterior. Um, the cap is usually quite flat and has a slightly depressed center. Um, but once again, this can become quite deformed and upturned with age. So don't necessarily base it off of a flat cap and slight dimple alone. So now we've got the stink horn and it very much lives up to its name um, and it's a fungi that you will typically smell before you see it. Now it grows between June and November and can be found anywhere where dead wood is present. The stem itself is quite polystyrene like in texture uh, and although you can't see it in this photo the cap does uh, start out as quite smooth and dark but it produces this rotting egg smell, uh, which attracts flies and the flies will slowly eat away at the cap, which leaves this honeycomb like appearance, which you can see in this photo. Uh, now, as the flies eat away at this cap, they'll get covered in spores, um, which they will then distribute wherever they venture. Um, so they, yeah, they spread this smelly fungi far and wide. Uh, now, wax caps are incredibly rare fungi, and the pink wax cap is particularly stunning uh, with its bright white stem and rosy cap. Um, if you're lucky enough, uh, you might find them between August and December. It will most likely be in amongst unfertilized grasslands, churchyards, and sheep graze commons. Um, they're often found just growing by themselves, uh, but you can occasionally find them in groups. Uh, and with any wax cap, the cap is slightly waxy and greasy to the touch, and that's exaggerated even more after rain. Um, when the fungi are young, they're typically umbrella shaped like the top image, but as they age, they'll become more upturned and deform like the bottom one. Um, now, I could have put up any wax caps because they really are amazing. Um, so I would wholly recommend Googling wax caps at some point as the variety in colours are just brilliant. Uh, and if you're lucky enough to find them, then do be sure to report them to your local record centre, like the DBRC, or a fungi group, um, as often the areas where they are found will require protection to protect that species. Okay, and um, finally, uh, we have the spookiest of fungi, uh, and this is called Devil's Fingers. 
Now, this is a scary looking mushroom and it's originally from New Zealand and Australia, but it made its way over to the UK in the early 20th century. Um, and I assume that wasn't by supernatural means. Um, it was initially found in Cornwall, but has since spread further throughout the Southwest. So it is present in Devon now. Um, these fungi can be found between summer and autumn. Um, I couldn't find a distinctive set of dates. Um, so it might be around then. Uh, and you're most likely to find it within damp broadleaf woodland or on wood mulch, which also tends to be quite damp. Now it is also related to the stinkhorn fungus and it has its own unique unpleasant smell. Um, so once again, you'll probably smell this fungi before you find it. Um, and although it is still quite a rare find, uh, it is thought to be spreading further through throughout the UK, um, predominantly as a result of climate change. Um, so it might be in a few more years, we start to see these popping up more and more often. Um, so that pretty much is all the fungi I'm going to talk about in terms of species. Um, so hopefully this has given you a good intro into the world of fungi and their ecology. I personally think that they're really fascinating and I would wholly recommend getting out and trying to spot some. Just the variation in colours alone make them exciting finds. Um, and so, yeah, keep an eye out when you're on a walk and definitely venture off the path where it's safe to do so, as that's where you're more likely to find some of the undisturbed specimens. Um, now, yeah, this will be uploaded onto the Green Minds website, so you can look back at this on the future. But if you do want to learn more, then I would definitely recommend finding a field guide and maybe getting in, in contact with local groups whether that's online or in person. Now, fungi are also seem to be really trendy at the moment, and there's a whole host of different programs on various streaming services. Um, so do give those a watch if you can, um, as they are really good. And I would just like to say thank you very much for attending. Uh, and if you've been saving up any questions, I think this will be the time to ask them now, or if you've posted them in the chat. Um, and yeah, we'll get on with that. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. That was that was brilliant. Um, the pictures are just incredible, aren't they? Just such mm. amazing diversity of, of all the different species. But I have think I have spotted a few of those ones that you mentioned. A um, couple of things. Yeah, uh, I, I loved about the zombie fly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also, I never imagined that you would mention that you played noughts and crosses on a... <laughs> Of yep. the mushroom <laughs> and also for anyone who was reading the audio captions throughout obviously there were quite a lot of errors it doesn't cope very well with all science but also it, it persistently put fun guy instead of fun <laughs> guy but hopefully you were able to get the the general gist so yeah if you have got any um questions i'm just uh, gonna get the chat up now um Please oh. do um, let us put it into the chat. Also, any comments or just any general feedback on the talk, um, that'd be great. We've got about sort of 10 minutes. Someone has asked, um, where should, could they report a sighting of something like the pink cap? And I think that's yeah. on the DBRC website, is it? Jack? Yeah, so the Devon Biodiversity Records Centre has a website. Um, within that website, there is a section um, where you can put in your data. You can also email it to us. So our email addresses are all on that website, um, but also just a group like the Devon Fungal Group. Um, you could go on their website and contact them as well. Yeah, and, and what I'll do is um, I usually do a follow-up email after these talks. So I will pop into that some links to things like the field guide. Um, Jack, you can email me some interesting links. I'll add them in. Yep. Um, and some of those groups that we mentioned, and also that link. Um, and someone else has said, what um, are there any other books or actually films that you were suggesting? Because you said there was some really good stuff that you can watch. Is there anything yeah. in, you had in mind for that? Or should we just try and find some stuff for the follow up? Yeah, I can't. Yeah, I can't remember specifically. Um, I know there's a chap called Michael Pollan um, who's written a few books and I think he has uh, 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 something on Netflix and there's also a man called Paul Stamets um, 
so and he's also produced quite a few things but i'm not sure of um the names but there are things available yeah um, and, and i've okay. had a, i've oh. had some direct messages as well um oh, which yeah, i don't know if you can see yeah. but um uh midge has asked about uh, a fungal species which is used for making tinder um now this one is called king alfred's cake um and it kind of looks like a black lump and it exclusively grows on ash trees um and so it's doing really well at the moment because of ash dieback so if you find some ash and you find a black lump on it that will be king alfred's cake um, and that's the one that you can use to make tinder yeah i've actually collected that and we've used yeah. it to try and get the fire the wood burner going the only thing i'd say is don't just collect it and put it in your pocket because you'll get absolutely covered in black because as it starts degrading it, it goes really really black on your hands but put, take put it in a little plastic bag or something yeah but yeah it does does seem to work did you have any other questions to, to you yeah, I've got a few. Um, what's the difference between a mushroom and a toadstool? Um, I'm not entirely clear on that myself, um, but I think it's just a grouping based off of the looks of certain fungi, um, like the fly agaric. But you also get uh, another closely related mushroom called the royal agaric, I think. Um, so I think it's just based off of those with that typical kind of fly agaric shape, really. And also somebody was asking, um, where did the uh, dead man's finger come, fungi come from originally? I don't know. I'm not sure if they mean the name of it or the actual place. But Yeah, so the devil's finger fungi, I think. Uh, I think it came from New Zealand and Australia. Um, I'm not sure exactly where. Um, and I suspect it was probably brought over by the Victorians or something as they tend to introduce quite a lot of non-native species. Oh, well, um, so are there very many? You know, you said there are like 15,000 species. Are there very many of those that are introduced? And is that a problem, do you think? I'm not entirely sure. Um, that's something I don't know, um, but definitely worth looking up. Get Yeah, get in touch with the Devon Fungus Group and yeah. <laughs> ask, yeah. ask an expert. Oh, yeah, they were asking geographically. That's right. Um, yeah. Uh, and I just wanted to re-emphasize your point really about being ultra cautious uh, and we're yeah. not recommending that you try any of these. And I think the uh, things I've read or heard is that if you are going to be going out or with a group or get some expert advice, even if you do try and cook any of these, I think you should only ever do one at a time <laughs> and keep a sample ready just in case that you're unwell and then obviously you, you can report it to your GP and that say I've eaten this and it's made me unwell but I've always been far too scared <laughs> to, to eat anything but yeah I recommend some of the fungal foray walks um uh yeah that was all my comments so if there are I'll just give people a minute for any other comments um but apart from that if there's no other questions i think I'm, i might have anyone? a few more popping up which i'll have a look at okay um there's one from martin are there any emerging trends that show the impact of climate change on uk fungi um i haven't seen any studies myself but that's because i've not deliberately been looking at this um but i would think with kind of most plants and species there's a general northward shift due to climactic conditions. So as it's colder up north, species that are getting too hot further south tend to move more northwards. Um, so I don't know if this would also happen with fungi, but it's pretty universal. So I suspect that might be happening. And, and there's quite a lot of um, developing soil science, isn't there now mm. around the incredible way we've often ignored sort of the soil and what's going on underneath our feet we've been looking at the vegetation above but uh, um i think the fungi and, the, and all the mycelium and everything under the ground is incredibly crucial isn't it for soil structure and it kind of linking root tree roots together and all, all this i think there's some really interesting science around that that's probably available online yeah um so uh, this is from Shan, Shannon, I think. I think the name's cut off. Um, but um, specific, 
uh, do specific fungi tend to grow together in groups? And if so, why? Um, I don't know as if different species grow together in specific groups, um, but I think it's just a, a growth pattern that will have emerged over time. Um, and it's also dependent on conditions somewhat. So if conditions are really great uh, for a fungi and they can get lots of nutrients, then they can produce more fruiting bodies and spread further. Um, whereas if the um, conditions aren't as good, they can probably only invest a little bit less energy and produce the one fungi, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you for that. Um, um, any, have you got any other questions there? Yeah, uh, this isn't a question, but Joy said that the devil's fingers are out at the moment near Burrator, so I'll have to get out and try and oh, find those. Yeah. Uh, so that's nice to know. Um, Midge has asked a question which I don't know the answer to, um, but I'll definitely look up afterwards, which is when do mushroom species mix their genes and at what point in their life cycle? So I do know that um, spores are different to our typical um, sort of sperm and an egg in animals. Um, so they are a single cell, a spore, which will then reproduce fungi from itself, which in my mind would kind of be clonal. Um, but yeah, I'm not entirely sure. Presumably there is some diversity in there. Um, what else is there? Oh, there's some really good questions, which I, I don't know the answer to. Um, Martin's asked, many plants rely on animals consuming them to spread the seeds to the fungal spores survive transit through animals' digestive tracts. Um, I think some possibly would, uh, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, but yeah, they definitely do thrive inside bodies as well, like that zombie fly. Um, so I'm sure there will be some that grow out of, um, yeah, waste material. Um, yeah, Jenny has said it seems that this year is a good uh, fungi year um, and because there have been no significant frosts, they seem to be continuing longer. Yeah, I think that's definitely right. I think, yeah, climatic conditions just seem to have really suited fungi this year. Um, that definitely been more um i think the uh but we're just seeing the fruiting bit part yes. aren't we so presumably the weather above ground isn't does it how much does it affect what's going on below the ground well i think temperatures would still impact upon the um the mycelium themselves um mm. and also the amount of water content because that's really important um i know people typically Tend to think that when you have a large amount of rain then the following few days it's probably going to be really good for fungi um because i think those damp conditions are really important so i think it definitely will affect uh, the prevalence of fungi in a year um okay. yeah and i think that's pretty much it for my questions okay someone's just popped a comment saying there's there is a great documentary on netflix on fungi a u.s documentary but it has lots of interesting information about mycelium so there yeah. you are there's plenty of stuff out there for those who are interested so I think we'll finish a few minutes early because I think we're all done but um, I hope you've enjoyed the talk um, thanks very much um, Jack for giving up your time and preparing the talk for us no um, and we have got um, quite a few other talks planned for this winter when it, we can't get out so much and do stuff especially in the dark evenings and um, so take a look at the a Green Minds Plymouth website, but also the Devon Wildlife Trust website events page has as our Green Minds events, but lots of other events as well. Some of those are uh, uh, around the county and some are in person, some online. So yeah, there's there's uh, no excuse for, <laughs> for not uh, learning more about these fascinating subjects. So um, thanks again um, and uh, good evening, everybody.